We are excited today. We have a wonderful author named Lewis Campbell. We call him Lou. He is a good friend, and he has come out with another book. He has over 50 books. Um, This new one, I think it might be our favorite. It's called Texas Rising, and it is all about the emerging of Texas in the 1880s, 1800s. Yes. And it's got trail riding, cowboys, Interesting cattle. and unusual stories. And that's one of Lou's very best features is he takes uh, uh, real life vignettes and experiences uh, either of his own or, or that he has read about, heard about, and people he knows. And he puts them together in the most entertaining, interesting uh, way in his books. And so Texas Rising is one of those and a little bit different from some of the other books that he has done it is and you know if you are quarantined in or sheltering in or you love to read this is we enjoyed it so much i just finished it yesterday and uh it was a nice escape and it also visited all the areas that you and i being in the cattle ranching families the slaughters and the beals um there were a lot of locations in it and things about it that we just loved if you've never read about that um the um Forgotten Cattle King talks about the Beale family and the Slaughter family and the Ox years and all the cattle ranchers back then. But Texas Rising was a cl- is a collection of stories. But um, we I think our favorite was the first one. And so we have Lou here to join us. Welcome to the show, Lou. Are you there, Dr. Lou? Oh, there you are. Hello. Okay. Hi, how are you? We are, we are good. It's so good to have you. And... Uh, We've been uh, putting out some information about the show today, and all of our listeners are really looking forward to hearing from you. Well, I appreciate that. Now, Lewis, you have classes where you teach people how to write as well, because after reading this book, uh, you know, I thought, gosh, you know, it'd be so great for people quarantining in um, in this time to write their memories or to write about the quarantine or to just write their book that they, I mean, they say everyone has a book in them. Would you agree? Well, I agree with you, and I agree with that that concept, too. Uh, the more you read, the more you increase your vocabulary, and the more you fertilize your imagination. But the basic idea is to communicate, and life's experiences are not all happy. Certainly all this business of being quarantined and and being anxious about where, what, uh, where the income is going to be coming from, it's really all part of life. And my bride and I have traveled around the world in many different contexts, and what we take for granted here in our country is totally unknown in most of the rest of the world. So when we're inconvenienced, that's only a minor point, especially if you realize what's happening in the rest of the world. Now I'm off the track a little bit. But the bottom line is to, to, to be able to communicate and, and personally to be able to find other people, especially older people, who've lived it. And they're really quite eager to talk about it, but nobody seems to be prepared to listen. Well, and I think, Lou, when I, you have such an incredibly rich background being in classical theater and mime and being a director for classical theater for like 50 years all around the world. We were talking about the theaters you've designed in different areas around the world and all the different countries you've lived in. You are definitely a person that knows what you're talking about when you say that about other countries. It also gives you this rich background for writing. And I think a lot of people could be intimidated by that because they don't have that. But yet what your whole class that you have in Granbury teaches, it's a writing clinic for getting things down on paper, no matter what about you, anything about your life and your memories, and you share how to do that. Exactly. And like I said, in one case, uh, from my personal experience, I had the opportunity Uh, My mother lived to be 90. Mm. She passed away years ago, but uh, when she was 87, I had the opportunity to interview her with a cassette tape recorder. You don't even see those anymore. I went up and interviewed her, and I said, Mom, I want you to tell me about your life. And I just said, I'm going to put this recorder down here on the coffee table between us. Just ignore it. It'll pick pick up the voices. So I started out and said, what's the first thing you remember? 
when you were a kid. And she thought for a moment and she said, I remember the factory whistles and the, and the boat whistles going off. She grew up, she was born and raised in Brooklyn. And mm-hmm. she said all these whistles were going off and it was a celebration of the armistice of the First World War. Good, Nobody that... talks about that anymore. <laughs> Right. No, but, but it's <clears throat> it's great that you got to ask her about that. You know, I asked yeah. I did a writing with my grandmother and she was talking about before electricity and then when they got electricity and then when right. they got their first car, the when cars started and airplane. It was such an incredible thing to write about and people just don't realize that their life has so much in it. And we just actually got my right. dad a book like that where he could write about his life. And um, we would just really encourage everyone to do that. And when I look at you have put out so many books and you tell these stories for Texas Rising, you did a lot of research about Texas, didn't you? Yes. Well, of course, I lived a lot of it. Uh, Some of it, interestingly, came about just by traveling through an area and knowing what happened years ago when uh, our girls were still with us. Our, Our youngest is now 43. Um, but when they, when they were with us in the car, we traveled a lot by car. And we would come across these signs, historical marker ahead. I remember <laughs> the youngest one said, here comes another hysterical marker. <laughs> well, some of them were hysterical, but uh, I usually would tell them before we got there what it was about. And they were kind of amused by that. In some cases, we wouldn't even stop. Because they were so amused by me telling about what that was. Mm. And we had the occasion to trace the Oregon Trail, for example. And it's still available, but who cares? Only people who are interested in reading. And, of course, some of my books and some of the more popular books are the old westerns. I have had one critic say that uh, it's like a, a Louis L'Amour re- reincarnated. Well, I wouldn't presume that. Uh, he was a magnificent writer. I read a lot of his work and a lot of Zane Gray and obviously a lot of Shakespeare and a lot of Tolstoy. Uh, I read a lot. Well, in this and, book, in this book especially, Texas Rising, you have yes. Fort Worth on my mind is one of the first chapters. Yes. And the yes. areas that you're talking about are Fort Worth back in the 1800s. And you talk about Main Street. You talk about Hell's Half Acre, the Exchange right. Street, the livestock pens, the stock exchange. Right. Yeah, a uh, lot of these places still exist. Yes. You know, down there. They we, do exist. Yeah. That's part of what provoked my imagination to go into the old stockyards mm-hmm. in the north part of Fort Worth. Yep. It's all a very big tourist trap. Yes. And they have an uh, amazing amount of information readily available. Yeah, they really you do. You have to dig yeah. a little bit, but you, when you look at the buildings there, look, this building was built in 1893. It says right on the building. Yes. Right. On the cornerstone. Well, what happened in 1893 to make it? Uh, make them want to have a building like that. Mm-hmm. And it's still not only there, it's occupied. Going down to uh, Cowtown is one Cattle's of the... Cowtown's Hotel is a great example. Yes. You go in there in the, in the lobby of the hotel, there is a very nice, elegant, old furniture, very durable, and a cage, which is the registration area. And one thing ominously not visible is any television anywhere in the lobby. Yeah, that's, that's good. because that's how it used to be. And guess what? People actually have to talk to each other. Well, they do talk to each other simply because of the environment. Now, what does that say about our current world where families don't even eat at the table anymore? They're all, either all locked into their cell phones or they're all watching TV. And no wonder we're becoming, uh, we're downgrading our culture simply because of that kind of behavior. Well, when you start reading this book, in um, the first chapter talks about Clyde Curry. Mm-hmm. Clyde mm-hmm. Curry was finally finished. He had delivered the herd of the widespread of West Texas desert and into the sprawling mm-hmm. cattle pens of the Fort Worth stockyards. With their new right. slaughterhouses on the hill bidding for any livestock they could get, the burgeoning cities in the east had many hungry mouths, and even the military required much beef. Mr. Greenleaf W. Simpson from Boston had come west to realize his vision and offered 50 cents per pound on the hoof. More than 
the <laughs> other slaughterhouses in the business. So the price for cattle raising had finally risen to a livable wage now. And you go on and you talk about uh, he walked up the exchange street from the livestock pens to the Fort Worth Stockyards Exchange and Hotel Building. Satisfied with mm-hmm. his work and the promise that Jim Dunham would meet him that evening to finalize the sell. And you actually talk about a bank that's still in Fort Worth. And I, 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 um, I because of definitely my background with my family, I love this. I love this story. And I noticed that you have other books where you've written about Colorado and different places in Colorado. And I've read those. And there was a tie. I think that was Paradise. The first one was called Your Other Paradise Series, Paradise Remembered, yes. Paradise, all those books. Yes. They were so there good. And you tied... that series, yes. and each book has 25 short stories that are actually true. And you but... tied these to that because they're going to they're take the herd from Fort Worth to Colorado. And so you yeah. go all the way through Texas, um, in the um, which I love that you used... Uh, What's his name? What's his name? Light, 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 uh, the cattle man. Oh, my gosh. Uh-huh. You used his trail and uh, loving. Oh, oh okay. okay he, well, yeah. you talk about Chisholm trail. trail. Well, you talk about the when good night it, loving trail. Was, why in the world is he doing that? The, the good night loving trail, trail, yeah. was the good night loving trail. Charlie Goodnight and Loving developed a trail that went from Fort Worth down to Pecos, good. which is 400 miles southwest in order to take the cattle up to Colorado. But the reason they did that is because the Pecos River flows up from the Gulf. It doesn't flow, it flows down to the Gulf, but going to Pecos, the city, the town, yeah. and going up river, they would go by, past Fort Sumter in, in uh, New Mexico, where there was a large population of Indians that were peaceful but were relying on the military for food and beef. And then they would keep going all the way up the front range to Denver. That was the original trail. Yes, uh, and you know, good night. decides, well, why don't we just cut up the Brazos? Well, and I if know. If you know your history, you would know that by that time, there was a lot of fences up around Lubbock. He said, I'll go up the Brazos and cut over to the Canadian, and I'll save all these 400 miles. Well, you, you saw what happened in yes. the Yes, so. and you know, Charles, good night is an incredible... And there's so much incredible cattle history for Texas there. We, you can go to the Goodnight Ranch on your way to Wichita, yes. Wichita Falls, or on the way to uh, um, Albuquerque yeah. even when you're cutting through Amarillo. Yes. And right. so you can go see that. And he also uh, experimented with um, hybrid herds that would do better in Texas. And so it's it right. was really cool. And Loving, his daughter, the Goodnight's daughter, married Loving, Mr. Loving, and so they joined uh-huh. together in the cattle business. And so I was reading, I recognize so many of these people, but it's just great that you wrote about Texas history that way. And it's such an enjoyable read. And I just encourage people to get the book, Texas Rising, uh, the historic fiction of the great state of Texas. And I know for your, your original title, you wanted it to be emerging Texas or something. You know, it was Texas emerging yeah. from the 1800s. And um, it is such a good story. Now, Lou, when we come back, we want to help people know how to write these memories for themselves. And I know that you have a class clinic. Um, are you going to be doing that online? Yes, it is online. It's online. Uh, for, the, for the most part, I have people all over, all over the world that are writing. Yes. It's not because I'm a writer. It's because I'm trying to provoke them to use what they have in their experiences and in their vocabulary to communicate the ideas that they have about their life. It's not an ego trip. I don't write for ego purposes. I write for passion. I write in spite of the fact that the books are not flying off the shelf anywhere. Well, let's tell them when they get back. Get them, know how to get them, and enjoy reading them. Yes, and we have to take a break and hear from our partners. When we get back, we're going to talk about this class and how to sign up for it. So stay right here so you can hear Dr. Lou teach you how to write your memories. Are you suffering with arthritis or osteoporosis? Do you have diabetes? Did you know that these are just two of the hundreds of diseases that have seen improvement with Dr. Wallach's incredible longevity products? You can't get them at a health food store. The only way to get them is to call us at 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Do you have heart disease, fibromyalgia, or high blood pressure? Do you have a terrible time losing weight? 
Dr. Wallach can help. He was a veterinarian and cured diseases in animals. He felt that he could do the same for humans, so he became a physician. Over 50 years of research and helping people like you goes into every bottle of Dr. Wallach's amazing discoveries. Do you want to feel better? Learn how to treat the cause of your problem rather than covering up the symptoms with drugs. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. They say we're not getting any younger, but many thousands have felt younger after a few short months using Dr. Wallach's all-natural longevity nutritional supplements. How many times have you said one of these days I need to call Dr. Wallach and find out what I need? Well, make that day today. Here's how to get that information. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Write that number down and make the call. The information is free and there is no pressure. So do it now. That's 800-214-0065. If you face health challenges such as heart disease, arthritis, diabetes, fibromyalgia, depression, infertility, ADD or ADHD, high blood pressure, or one of hundreds of other diseases, help is available. All you have to do is make the call. You have nothing to lose but the pain and suffering. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. You've been listening to Dr. Wallach, and I bet you have some questions. We want to help, and here's how you can get the answers. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Write that number down and make the call right now. Don't wait any longer to find out how Dr. Wallach's own all-natural nutritional supplements by Longevity can help you. Are you concerned with reducing your risk of heart disease, cancer, stroke, or high blood pressure? Help is available. Do you have arthritis, sore joints, lower back pain, or fibromyalgia? Call now. Dr. Wallach creates his own formulation so you can be sure that what is on the label is actually in the bottle. Whatever your health challenge, make this call. Thousands like you have seen results for a happier, healthier life. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Call today, 800-214-0065. If you're looking for quality furniture and bedding, you know it's hard to find. The big stores are very expensive, and others sell shabby products that don't last. The answer is Family Mattress and Home Store at 990 U.S. Highway, 287 Frontage Road in Mansfield. They present premium Amish-made bedroom sets and top brand mattresses such as Serta and Beautyrest. You'll find massage chairs, sectionals, and things other stores just don't carry. All of the U.S.-made furniture at Family Mattress and Home Store is of the highest quality and built to last. You can get a preview online at FamilyMattressAndHomeStore.com. That's FamilyMattressAndHomeStore.com. But better yet, come to the showroom at 990 Highway 287 Frontage Road in Mansfield today to find the perfect gift for a loved one or yourself. Payment plans available. Family veteran and locally owned. 817-225-2442. That's 817-225-2442. Family Mattress and Home Store, where family matters. And now here's more Getting Better with Ann Beal on 1160 AM KBDT. Lou Campbell, the author of Texas Rising, he is helping us today. He has 50, over 50 books he's written. The Memories memories for Tomorrow, he is a, has a writing clinic for those interested in publishing their stories. We really encourage you during this time. It would be great if you could even just write what's happening, what you see around you wherever you live. You know, if things are is, more isolated, if downtown is blank, you know, if you don't see anyone down there, or if there's masks people are wearing everywhere. I mean, we were just talking about it at breakfast, weren't we, Jim? Mm-hmm. We were. Just how strange it is. Yeah, it's a uh, it's totally different experience from what we've ever had before. So, so Lou, are you there? Hello, Lou, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, there you go. Okay. okay. I was like, where are you? Yes, okay. <laughs> so we were talking about online for you, for your class. Um, if you would like, if they would like to reach you, number one, they can just reach you at Lou. L O U at Enclave of the Arts dot org. But how right. uh, an Enclave E N C L A V E of the Arts A R T S dot org. How would yeah, they sign up? Like hearts, 
because that's the way computers do it. Okay. It, it, enclave of the Arts looks like Enclave of Hearts. Enclave of Hearts. Dot org. It's an org, though, not a com or not net. Yeah. So how did they sign up for your class? Well, if they write me and tell me what it is they're trying to do, mm-hmm. then I'll be able to give them an adequate quote that will assist them in, in generating it. I have I have a fellow in, in Plano that's writing right now. Yes. And he's getting a little hung up, which is big, the biggest problem. In writing, you have to constantly write a little bit each day so that it becomes a habit. So that's Since why you there's no... that off till the weekend, yes. that will be very difficult because your whole mindset changes. Having finished a week of work, now what are you going to do? Oh, I have to write. No, you don't. You want to write. It's a matter of a starter fluid package. What is it you're trying to do and why and to whom? So would they, you can watch. they text you on your cell, or do you just want them to they reach you by that. email? They could do that, although that becomes a real problem. And if they call me, I won't answer if I don't recognize a number okay. because of all these robocalls. So let me say the email again, and I'll put it on the show page if you want to go to Getting Better okay. with Ann Beal. Um, so Dr. Dr. Lou, L-O-U. No, so, dot. It's D-R-L-O-U. There's no dot after the doctor. D-R-L-O-U. Oh, you put it up at. here like it was Dr. Dot Lou. Okay. So oh, Dr. Lou at enclaveofthearts.org. Mm, okay. Right. Um, and, and, and that's Dr. Put, Lou Campbell. If interested in writing as a subject, that will help me filter through, and, and, uh, and I will respond. Yes, he will respond. So to start, and we only have two minutes right now to really talk about this you have the different sections that you talk about and you break it down into four parts right so it doesn't matter how big their vocabulary is or that they've never had any experience writing before we start with where they are and what will happen is they'll discover they need more vocabulary they don't need it at the moment but they could always enhance that some of the best things, I've had, best responses I've had from my books is people will write and thank me for challenging them to go to the dictionary with some of the words that I use. It's not, I'm not trying to be clever or, or uh, profound, but when you communicate, even on the streets, the people that try to communicate to each other, most of the people have a, you know, phrase in there. Yeah. You know means they don't know how to communicate, am I coming through to you? So you don't write, you know, in the text. That's a good example. All you do is find what it is you're trying to say and what's the most efficient way to say it. I think most people, when they're writing a story or a book, they probably wouldn't put that. But I know for right. me, when I when I start writing, I think that's a boring word. I wonder if there's a better word for that, you know, for right. it's overcast. Oh, okay, so look up balmy or whatever. Right. That gym is really good, and Dr. Slaughter is joining us, of course. I didn't introduce you today. Is that why you've been so quiet? Oh, no, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm good. I'm glad to be here as always, and uh, really appreciate you, Lou, and always enjoy talking to you, especially about your books and your writing. Well, and Jim, you know, he uh, he has an incredible vocabulary, probably for how much he's read. I've read all my life, and it's just one of the things that I love doing. And when I have spare time, I'm uh, usually reading. Yeah. So, yeah, That's I love the it. Same love as it. me. I do that same thing, too. In fact, I, I read all the time. In fact, I'm at the library down here in Granbury a good deal of the time. The people know me already down there pretty well. I don't know what I'm after. is usually not available. I'm usually into a on library, a library long book kind of thing. Yeah, and I know the the more people read, the bigger their vocabulary is because they learn right. so much. I um, I know that for people, we just want them to get things down on paper and just to start. So when we come back from break, I want you to be able to just start telling them if you'll just start going through some of the basics of what they can do now. To start writing, Lou, that would be great. Okay, so stay right here, and we'll start on the four sections. Just how to start into your own memories. Got an old car? Senior care for your mom or dad, but don't know where to start? Hi, I'm Joan London with The Place for Mom. Nobody knows your parent or loved one better than you, and nobody knows senior living better than the experts at A Place for Mom. They've helped thousands of families find the right place for their mom or dad. I was so glad that I called A Place for Mom. My advisor really listened and was truly my partner in finding senior care for my dad. 
She went out of her way to get to know him as a person and was always there whenever I had a question. The senior living advisors at A Place for Mom partner with thousands of families every month, listening and offering local knowledge and advice to help find the best senior living communities across the country. And it's a free service. Here's the number. Call A Place for Mom at 1-800-370-2715. There's a place for answers, a place for mom. Call today. Call a place for mom at 1-800-370-2715. That's 1-800-370-2715. Dreaming up the ideal retirement is your job. Helping you get there is ours. That's why we encourage you to contribute to an Edward Jones IRA by April 15th. By investing in an Edward Jones IRA, you can take advantage of potential tax benefits for 2019 and give your money more time to potentially grow. To help you make sense of your retirement goals before the April 15th tax deadline, contact Fritz Beckworth, your local Edward Jones financial advisor at 128 South Cockrell Hill Road, DeSoto, Texas. Edward Jones, making sense of investing. Member SIPC, 972-274-0237. Hi, this is Dr. Phil. The new coronavirus called COVID-19 is spreading in China and beyond. While CDC is working to stop the spread of the virus, we can all play a role in stopping this deadly disease. The CDC Foundation is a nonprofit organization supporting emergency response efforts in the United States and around the world. To get updates and learn how to protect friends and loved ones, find out how to help by going to cdcfoundation.org. How's your golf game? Meet Pat Wheeler, host of Texas Links on the Air. The thing I love about golf, it's the discussions are never ending. You can talk about anything and it's interesting. The clothes, the courses, the instruction, the equipment, and the people who play, of course. The quote of the year so far, Dr. Lee Mack said, I'll be 110 days. I think I'll get a Hershey bar and go hit some balls. That's what we talk about on Texas Links on the Air. Don't miss it. Texas Links on the Air, Saturday mornings at 8 on 1160 AM, KBDT. It's getting better, a little better, all the time. If you'd like to get better, call Ann right now. 214-810-8255. 214-810-TALK. Now more with Ann Beal on 1160 AM KBDT. You know, Dr. Lou, I really encourage people to write now because daily life looks very different now than it did four months ago. Just on a regular basis, don't you think? Yes, I think I mean, it's true of every day, even though now it's more acute, because first of all, they have more time, because if they're, if they're, I don't mean locked in their home, but if they're obliged to be at home, uh, there's only so much TV you can watch. I guess that's one of the good things <laughs> about this. Yes. People get so sick of the same crap that's on television, yeah, there's... and they fail to realize that that's an alternative to writing, and it's a lethal alternative as far as their education. Well, and when I've, you're spoon-fed on yes. television, you're given the images. When you yes. read a book, and you certainly have read a book that you've also seen a movie about, inevitably, your reading of it is better than the, book, than the video or than the, the film, especially if you read it first. Because yes. when you read it after you've seen the movie... You say, oh, yeah, this is the scene that, well, it may or may not be. It's a different interpretation of material. I think that unusual scenes are even playing out in people's homes that they could write uh-huh. about. You know, even just getting tired of searching, trying to find stuff, anything. Life is just different for people, whether they're in their homes or their parks or they go to grocery stores or they just, in streets across the country, I mean, things are so different. And you're right. It's so clear now, and things are kind of sped up how severely different they are. But in general, a person's life, because you look at, you've lived, you know, 75 years, and you look at everything, all the knowledge you have based on your history to put things down on paper. But in light of everything that's gone on in this four months, I mean, people have lived what normally would have taken like 10 or 15 years for all these things to have evolved. I mean, look at how many books could be written just about the last four months. Well, and the problem is you have to discover, they say, well, I really like to write. Is it an escape for the individual? Or you have to ask yourself the question, what is the story that you're trying to present? And who is your audience? Who's your audience? I, I have a, another dear friend who is in the writing work back in North Carolina, and she's writing children's books, children's stories. Another one in San Antonio who's not one of my one of my clients, but she is already she's very close because she's writing this stuff already, and it's wonderful. The use of imagination, 
Um, and, you know, ultimately, what experiences do you have? I have another young lady here who was only an eighth grader here in, in uh, Granbury, and she wants to write. I thought she was older, actually, because she's quite. She's got quite a good vocabulary, but she's in the eighth grade, and uh, uh, she sent me her uh, the first part of her manuscript, and it's very well written, very well thought out. But there are uh, uh, other kinds of issues. What is the point of view that you're writing from? Is it a first-person point of view? Is using the word "I" or using the word "he" or "she"? Uh, becomes a third person. In some cases, it's better if it's a first person. You saw that in Texas Rising. Yeah. In some of the stories there. Some of them were not first person. Some of them were third person. But it depends on how you employ the word. Well, you had and a first person from Clyde Curry's perspective. Right. Um, so right. you could make a character. I, I, I know that for you, you use specific locations as important. For your right. story, is that what spurred the ideas? Was you said actually being down in Cowtown spurred the idea? Well, that's kind of interesting because one of the stories in the book is called Lonesome Dutchman's Flat. And if you drive down 281 towards San Antonio from here, you don't go down 35W, you go down, you know, down 35, you go down a uh, U.S. highway, and you go through just you go through a little town of Heiko. And then halfway toward another town, well, almost to the other town of Hamilton, you're driving across this flat territory with wide open spaces. And all of a sudden, the road dips down in this little, pretty little valley, and it's called Hidden Valley. Hidden Valley. And there's a place at the bottom of that called Dutchman's Hidden Valley. And I've driven that route for years, and I know it provoked the idea for that story. About a, about a Dutchman who immigrated when the Texas was still a republic, and he wanted to be alone. He wanted to be a hermit, so went up and built a place out in the middle of nowhere, and lo and behold, everybody starts coming. Uh, totally reverse what happened, but it's a it's a comedy in that regard. So Dutchman's in case, The location is so, it provokes so much, and virtually all of the Paradise series in Colorado is exactly that. I don't know how it is I can remember. I'm, I don't have a photographic memory. But I do remember when I start thinking of something and all of a sudden it opens up for me. I remember that. And it's, it's reality that is recalling it. But then how do you temper that with the vocabulary that you have? Would you suggest people add pictures? Because if you think about yes. that hidden valley, because I know you showed me a picture of that valley in Colorado. You showed me a uh -huh, picture uh -huh. with the mountains behind it. Yeah, and pictures right. say so much, and they add so much to a story. Well, they can, but they also limit, because if you identify the location, a, a good example of that oh. is uh, the Eiffel Tower. For people who have seen the Eiffel Tower, it's in the context of their having seen it. Did they see it on public transportation? Did they actually visit it and go up in it, go up to the restaurant on the second level, or did they go all the way to the top? Um, uh, our, one of our daughters is, an, is a, a very good artist, and when she was in the ninth grade, she did a picture of the Eiffel Tower in a fog. How many people do that? They just draw the Eiffel Tower. No, yeah. she didn't want that. She wanted it in kind of uh, hidden. And so a point of view there is it's not the tower, it's the experience. And much later, she actually experienced the Eiffel Tower. So she was drawing it from what she had seen in pictures and everything. There's no doubt that it is the Eiffel Tower because it's kind of a unique promontory in, uh, in locations around the world. Well, and I but think see, people... How do you use it? How do you apply it? Yes. If you use too many pictures, then you might as well do a video of That's the true. experience, and that becomes a lot more extensive. Well, and I just want people to uh, start, and I want them to ignite the imagination. I know you have those four sections, the starter fluid, igniting the imagination, yeah. setting the right. story, and then the elements uh -huh. of the story. And right. so I think people get a little overwhelmed on how to do it. And when you, honestly, when you look up how to write a book, because I know with Jim's book, he's written a lot of books, but to actually start getting them published, you know, it can right. be overwhelming, like 23 steps to get to writing a book or you know, I mean, right. there's a lot of stuff in there, and you have it narrowed down to four sections, and that makes right. it so much more simple. 
And, um, you know, if people just think plot, character, thing, rhythm, I mean, they get overwhelmed, right? And so right. I think you offering an online class to kind of help them, and there is no time. There's not like the class is like a certain amount of time. You're willing to work with them, and like you did Jim. I mean, you've helped Jim a lot, and just to give him ideas, and when he got held up and things kind of blocked him, like, you know, he didn't want to plagiarize how to use some test or something. You gave him suggestions on what to do. And I think that um, you offer that to other people. Um, what do you think, Jim? What do you think was the biggest help from Lou for you? I think his uh, just a consistent encouragement. Lou would text me <clears throat> pretty consistently and say, um, how's your book coming? Have you published yet? Mm-hmm. This yeah, because and you, you were near continue to say it, those things, and yeah. and I was holding off. There was just something that I knew wasn't quite right yet, but you you continued to encourage me and exhort me, and and did it in a very kind way. This is your conscience speaking. This is your conscience <laughs> speaking. Right. And yes. so that was very very good for me. And and there were some suggestions along the way, but I think if anything, if you helped me in any way, that was the main way. Uh, just your encouragement, and I knew you were a valuable asset, and I knew that you would be there if I had questions and all kinds of things like that. So just right. walking with me through it was a big deal. That's why it can be so important for people to get on your website and to take advantage of um, of the teaching that you do. And you've been a teacher for a long time, Lou, I know. And so they would benefit right. from that. I had. A, can I ask this question, though? I was wondering, what would you tell somebody, Lou, who said, uh, we would say, I've thought about writing before, but... I just don't think anybody would be interested in reading what I'm what I wrote. Well, that's the point. What I mentioned in the the starter fluid. Who is your audience? Mm-hmm. Who would read this kind of material? I had that years ago, and I wrote some work that was about what old people think. Kind of an, uh, and and that, by the way, is included in the Paradise series. Several of those books. It's like going to. Um, a uh, retirement center or a nursing home. Uh-huh. And people with good intentions put their family members in nursing homes because they're capable of handling them uh, medically and otherwise. But in some cases, they, they soothe their conscience by they're being cared for, even though the family itself is not caring for them. They're simply paying to have them cared for. And yet those people sit there and vegetate with other people Many of them can't even hear, some of them can't even see. But if you go and hold their hand and talk to them in it, you will be overwhelmed by what they have to say and what their life was like. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take much encouragement to get a person to open up about their life. And many of the things I've learned and many of the things I've experienced and applied toward my books come from exactly that. Listen. To people and you know you want you want your memories written down i know that dr howard Hendricks, who's also a friend of yours he was yes, one of my professors a very dear friend, yes. yes and he was a professor with jim he was talking about how people what their kids will think of them and what did he say jim <laughs> he said your kids your kids don't really respect uh, to any great extent the right. things you did no matter how good you were at them you know you could have been right. a ball player you could have been an actor an author whatever your kids don't care right. because it's not their life and they just right. don't really understand until they get a lot older right. and they live through things and i right. i think that for me with older people when i get the book and i start writing they're they're and asking them like what it, you know what kind of music did you like when you were a kid what what did you dress what were your clothes like what was right. your favorite tv shows when you were a kid what did you do for fun when you hung out with your friends? And you just ask these questions and you start writing them down in these memory books, right? Their right. stories always fascinate me beyond. I'm just like, wow, that is so cool. Like my grandmother talking about they were one of the first people to get electricity and what that was right. like and changing their oil lamps to electric lamps or the first right. they had one of the first cars and what that was like. And that was incredible. And so you you can take stories and write books from that. But I really encourage, even if you're not writing a book out there, just even essays. And you can do essays with pictures. You could you could do videos. But I just encourage you to create kind of your own written piece that illustrates your life right now. And if it's taking what's happening now and turning it into fiction, 
Well, you almost don't have to. It's almost like fiction. It's almost like science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on the ugly side. <laughs> it's like, what? People walk around in masks. And, you know, you think what they used to say about the year 2020, that we were all right. going to be in spacesuits and things like that. And instead, we're all wearing masks. You know, it's right. just, it could be its own kind of science fiction. But I, I think that really encouraging people to put it down, because they do say that there's a book in everyone. And in your case, Lou, there were 50 books or more. You've still got oh, a long way more, to go. More than that. Interestingly, it was only a couple of years ago, my youngest daughter, who's a medical doctor in Fort Worth, uh, was out for dinner, and she said, Dad, would you do me a favor? I said, sure. She said, would you write your autobiography? Well, all of the Paradise series is autobiographical, but it's all fiction. Mm -hmm. Because there's no such place as Paradise, Colorado. Uh, the town was up in Little Colorado, and it's 200 feet underwater in a, a reservoir that the government put in long after I was there. Yeah, they flooded. But it was in the mountain country. And so I, I started writing my autobiography. I'm sure everybody's thrilled and can't wait to get it. <laughs> yeah. So far, I've gotten to uh, 1977, I think and I have 150,000 words. <laughs> uh, it's, it's about 400 pages. Who's going to read that thing? Well, I think I that there's so many cool things about know. your life and mime. I mean, mime, yeah. doing mime and mime theater all over the country. You know, we, you, yeah. you got into mime really early on and yeah. when you're in yeah. when i'm in europe i see mime everywhere you know i think it's not as familiar yeah. to people here in yeah. this country you're right you're right because the whole idea of theater and art if it is entertainment art is not entertainment art is something deeper and richer in a person's it life is. and a lot of my writing um, i don't mean fiction i'm talking about other writing is much more uh, focused on that and our culture unfortunately because of the technology that has been able to be developed in my lifetime but the television started in 1949 that was the first network and in 1959 I had a long stay in a hospital a community hospital in Colorado and there was no TV sets in the room and well, and a colleague, not a colleague, another patient came in who was my age. He was from Denver, and he just enlisted in the Navy, and he came over to see his girlfriend before he went to basic. Hey, Lou, and I'm after to break. Him. We got to yeah. take... Listening to Dr. Wallach, and I bet you have some questions. We want to help, and here's how you can get the answers. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Write that number down and make the call right now. Don't wait any longer to find out how Dr. Wallach's own all-natural nutritional supplements by Longevity can help you. Are you concerned with reducing your risk of heart disease, cancer, stroke, or high blood pressure? Help is available. Do you have arthritis, sore joints, lower back pain, or fibromyalgia? Call now. Dr. Wallach creates his own formulation so you can be sure that what is on the label is actually in the bottle. Whatever your health challenge, make this call. Thousands like you have seen results for a happier, healthier life. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Call today, 800-214-0065. They say we're not getting any younger, but many thousands have felt younger after a few short months using Dr. Wallach's all-natural longevity nutritional supplements. How many times have you said one of these days I need to call Dr. Wallach and find out what I need. Well, make that day to day. Here's how to get that information. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Write that number down and make the call. The information is free and there is no pressure. So do it now. That's 800-214-0065. If you face health challenges such as heart disease, arthritis, diabetes, fibromyalgia, depression, infertility, ADD or ADHD, high blood pressure, or one of hundreds of other diseases, help is available. All you have to do is make the call. You have nothing to lose but the pain and suffering. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Are you suffering with arthritis or osteoporosis? Do you have diabetes? Did you know that these are just two of the hundreds of diseases that have seen improvement? with Dr. Wallach's incredible Longevity products? You can't get them at a health food store. 
The only way to get them is to call us at 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Do you have heart disease, fibromyalgia, or high blood pressure? Do you have a terrible time losing weight? Dr. Wallach can help. He was a veterinarian and cured diseases in animals. He felt that he could do the same for humans, so he became a physician. Over 50 years of research and helping people like you goes into every bottle of Dr. Wallach's amazing discoveries. Do you want to feel better? Learn how to treat the cause of your problem rather than covering up the symptoms with drugs. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Everything's bigger in Texas, and your tax refund shouldn't be any different. Call Checks and Balances Texas now at 469-216-8161. Get the tax assistance you need and keep your social distancing at the same time. The best virtual tax services in the Metroplex are just a phone call away. Trust the veteran tax professionals at Checks and Balances Texas for the answers to all your tax questions, including everything you need to know about the tax filing requirements to qualify for your COVID-19 stimulus check, whether it's assistance with individual or business taxes or even bookkeeping services checks and balances texas is there to help they offer tax filing planning and resolution services to clients nationwide call checks and balances texas right now at 469-216-8161 or book an appointment online checksbalancestx.com join the movers and shakers of the dfw metroplex as a client of checks and balances texas 469-216-8161 or checksbalancestx.com Another book. You're getting better all the time. Now back to Ann Beal on 1160 AM KBDT. We were having so much fun on break talking about Chuck Wagon and Good Night, Charles Good Night, cattle riding and trail riding and those Chuck Wagon cooks and everything. Um, just escaping into that world of Texas history, um, fiction, what? just all about what happened back in the 1800s. It's such a cool book, Texas Rising, by Lewis Campbell. Again, we just encourage you to get it. You can get it on Amazon for like 12 bucks. It's not very expensive or something like that. Uh, it's such right. a great read during this time just to take you to an enjoyable place to escape. We just read at the pool yesterday, and I was just floating around reading, just really enjoying it, loving it. Uh, it's such a great time to do that. Thank you for this writing, Lou. I, I think more well, than anything you. for us with our families and everything, it was this one. I enjoyed your Paradise series for Colorado. It was such a wonderful series back in Colorado, but I couldn't relate as well as I could to this one because it's Texas. Yeah, you have Brazos River well, and Canadian. Texas. There are several others that are about Texas already out, and there's yeah. some that are combining much of the West, including Texas. Uh, I'm currently writing one that is about Texas. Again, it's about the Texas Rangers. And interestingly, the original Rangers weren't even paid employment-wise. They were paid by land. Yes. The original government gave them pieces of land for engaging in solving the, some of the medical, some of the um, legal problems they were having back in the early days of Texas. And some of the Texas Rangers were not the pure and upright kind of people you might have thought. They well, actually were uh, rather rankless people. Some of them <laughs> had uh, legal problems themselves. They weren't like they Walker Rangers. Because they were good in what they were doing. <laughs> yeah. I was talking about Chuck Norris, you know, Texas Ranger, Walker yeah, Ranger. Right. He does do some, <laughs> he does way. some older ones, you know, like um, he, in that TV series, he did some flashbacks to the old right. Western Rangers, right? But in general, right. it's not quite lo- like the show. But, um, right. yeah, I actually really enjoyed your writing because it tells you if you don't know a lot about Texas history and you want to be proud to live here, you know, it's really cool to go back and see all the things that happened. And you have the first bank draft that happened there, open in the first right. bank account. Uh, in the bank, and it's it's an interesting idea, and people thought it was weird. I mean, Clyde, the guy that you have in this story, he couldn't quite understand what they were telling him that they would put it on credit and he could use it around town because he was right. carrying his money on him. That's why they all had weapons, right, is right. they had their money on them that they made all the time. They carried it with them. They weren't going to leave it anywhere. And so... You know, one, and one of the other issues in uh, one of the stories called Unarmed and Extremely Dangerous yes. about a woman sheriff 
and she doesn't have to carry a weapon because everybody respects women and also respects the law. And in that story, there's a reference to a man who's called a buffalo soldier. Anybody have any idea what a buffalo soldier is? Sure it's do. a black person. Yep. No, I didn't and know that. that. You read that story. Solved the I problem had... with a quartermaster that came to town, and uh, and he solved it. And I just mentioned it in passing. It's not promoting Afro Americans or Mexicans. I have all kinds of people in my life and in history. They were just like the woman who needed a pelt. Well, hold on, she, hold on, Lou, hold on. I have home, I have home. to ask you a question though about this female mm-hmm. sheriff, okay? Because uh, Jim was telling me a little bit about that, and I said, did you find that from history? Because I've never heard of a female sheriff, or did you make that yes. up? Oh, no. There are female sheriffs. Really? In Texas and in Montana, there were a couple of big big names, and you didn't put up any crap there. Of course, they were cool. armed. This one, intentionally, I had her unarmed because everybody else around her respected the law. And by the way, that's the one where I introduced the old... The old-fashioned tiller steering vehicles that That's came right. around before the turn of the 20th century. They weren't readily available, but remember, we're talking about the age when railroads were functional. There were a lot of things technologically happening. And so that's one story I use that. I'm not really on. fond of some no. of those because the old ride on a wagon or on a horse, is, and I love that. I love riding on horses, and I love working with horses still. Well, Lou, we just well, we thank it. you so much for being on. We did enjoy your book. And again, there is another book out there called Texas Rising. It kind of bummed me out. Don't get that one if it doesn't say Lewis Campbell. We want you to get the one by Lewis Campbell, Texas Rising, on uh, the emerging Texas in the history in the 1800s. We just want to make sure you get the right one and enjoy this reading. And... Um, Lou, is there anything else you want to share about your books real quick before we end and your class? You have 20 seconds. Yes, sir. I hope that I hope people enjoy reading and the one thing it can do for them. I had a quote. I put that on Facebook not long ago. 10 seconds. Uh, you, you discover you have wings when you open a book and read. Yes, you discover it's you have wings. It's the process of developing a theater audience one at a time. Thank no, you, guys. Thanks for getting